G'day, I'm Graham Lorimer. This is an introductory video on grasses. I will demystify grasses for you. I'm going to concentrate on the temperate zones of both hemispheres because learning about grasses in the tropics and the equatorial zones is different and rather more complicated. But it will work in both the northern and southern hemispheres. I'll cover the structures of grass plants, the terminology that goes with those structures. I'll cover the biology and the ecology of grasses, which influences how grasses respond to things like grazing, fire, floods, or your management activities. So with that information, we can work out the optimum way of managing grassy environments. But why would you want to learn about grasses? Well, the first reason is grasses form by far the most important family of plants for humanity. Think about wheat, rice, oats, barley, bamboo. Think about pasture, playing fields, lawns, fairways. So grasses are extremely important for humanity, but they're also extremely important ecologically. I mentioned pasture. Think about what grazes on pasture or on natural grasslands. We've got animals ranging from bison through kangaroos down to um, tiny animals in the undergrowth. Think about animals that live on all the other parts of the grass plant as well. Think about mice and birds such as the finches, pigeons and parrots. Think about um, all of the insects that live on grasses, either on their leaves or on their seeds. Uh, so grasses are really important to a whole range of animal species. Grasses also provide habitat for a whole range of fungi, for example, rust that live on the foliage of grasses. So grasses provide a whole lot of habitat. Importantly, grasses are often the most important part of the base of the food chain. That would be true in grasslands, open woodlands and savanna, where grasses capture a lot of the sunshine. And ecologists speak about primary production, which is the transfer of sunlight into starches and sugars that then work their way up the food chain. And wherever grasses form a large part of the uh, interception of sunlight, they will form the base of the food chain. Even in a, a forest, you'll often find grasses provide a substantial fraction of the starches and sugars because they're still doing a lot of photosynthesis. Grasses, however, do not excel in rainforest due to low light or in saline conditions such as out at sea, and sea grasses are not true grasses or in salt marshes. Grasses also do not do well with very low fertility, such as in heathlands and heathy woodlands, although there are specialist species. Finally, grasses do not do very well in really wet conditions, such as wetlands and lakes. There they get out competed by groups such as the sedges and the rushes. So for all of these reasons, grasses are very important. Now let's talk about grass structure. Grasses and the related families that we commonly call sedges, rushes and some other families had ancestors which produced petals and structures in order to attract a pollinator. But grasses and those other relatives have evolved away any reliance on a pollinator. So they don't need petals, sepals, fragrances or colours, the sorts of things that in many plants we use typically for identification. Instead, those structures have evolved away to next to nothing and other structures have evolved into specialised structures with names like glooms and spikelets. And that's what creates a lot of the problems with people identifying grasses. So let's talk about the structure of a grass plant. I'm going to get you shortly to go out and collect some specimens of grass plants before we meet again. But um, I first need to introduce you to the grass species that I want you to collect and to show you what to look at when you're doing so. 
I've chosen an oat as one of the species of plant for you to collect. And that's because it's extremely widespread in the temperate zones of both hemispheres. It flowers most of the year and you won't cause any harm to the environment by collecting it. It's often found on weedy roadsides, but if you're collecting from a roadside, do make sure that you're keeping yourself safe from traffic. It's also commonly on floodplains and along creeks or rivers, um, and they're the best places to go to find uh, most of the plant species that I'm going to ask you to collect. Now, with the oat, um, I want you to pay attention to the structure of the grass leaf. Grasses and some rushes and some sedges have this specialised structure of each leaf having a blade, we speak of the blade of grass, and it's attached to a lower part called a sheath which encircles the stem. As you go out and collect oat and all of your plant specimens, have a look at the leaves. Check that structure for the two-part structure with a blade and a sheath. You'll notice that the sheath joins onto the stem at lumps called nodes, and they're growing points of the grass plant. Now, a quick introduction to the structure of the seed head, or what botanists call the inflorescence. And here I've got the upper part of this seed head or inflorescence having already shed its seed, which is why the parts that contain the seed have gone pale and there are no bristles sticking out of this part of the plant by comparison with the lower part of the plant. The whole thing we call a seed head, the parts out on the ends of the smallest branches which house the seeds are called spikelets. So all we've got left of the spikelets at the top of this inflorescence are the remains of the spikelets. They are called glooms and in almost all grass species there will be a pair of them. In some species there's only just one. There are never more than two. So we've got a spikelet which leaves glooms on the plant after the seeds have shed and on this plant it's still got seeds on the bottom and you'll see that the seeds have got bristles and you can pluck them out and there will be two or occasionally three separate seeds within each spikelet. So the terminology is that we have spikelets on the ends of the branches. A spikelet contains the seeds which depending on the species could be just one or could be two or could be many more. And once the seeds are shed what's left behind is a pair of glooms although in some species there might be only one. So that will give you an introduction to the structure of a grass plant for the purposes of going out and collecting your specimens. I'd like you to collect a specimen of oat and you'll have to do that right down to ground level. Whenever you collect a grass specimen don't just cut off the above ground parts you need to get a full stem, including a bit of the root at the base. For that purpose, I recommend using a two-pronged daisy digger. I put mine in a cork so that I don't injure myself when it's not in use. But using the two-pronged daisy digger will allow you to get a plant out, or just a single stem is all that's really necessary, um, and you need it with a bit of root and a bit of a runner if there is a runner. Runners can be above ground or below ground and they're really important identifying features. So I would like you to go and collect a specimen of an oat if you can find one. If you can't find one or even if you can another option is the prairie grass. Just like the oat I'd like you to collect one of these prairie grass plants or just a part of it down to the stem. The way you would recognize it is because of the shape of the spikelets, a spikelet being the part that's out on the ends of the branches. It's very flattened and has almost sharp edges on it. The size of a spikelet is distinctive of a species. It doesn't vary much from one plant to another within the species, unlike the stature of the plant. So your prairie grass plant might be a lot shorter or a lot taller, depending on the growing conditions. 
but the spikelets on a grass are very invariant according to growing conditions. That's one of the things that makes them useful for identification. Another useful thing for identification is that when you collect your grass specimen, carefully levering it out like this, and you look at the sheaths at the base of the plant, you'll find they're very fuzzy, but the blades are not. Remembering that grass leaves have that two-part structure with a blade and a sheath and at the junction again you'll find this ligule structure. So what I've got here is often called a tiller of a grass plant. I want you to collect a tiller of both the oat, probably bearded oat, doesn't matter which, and also a prairie grass plant. If you can't find the oat or the prairie grass, look for this. It's large quaking grass or Bryza maxima. It's easily identified by its distinctive spikelets, which are the bits that dangle at the ends of the branches here. Typically at the um, top of the dangling spikelets, you'll see some color coded brownish glooms as they're called. Glooms are the parts of the spikelet which are most directly attached to their stalk. Should be fairly distinctive to find and I'd like you, as in the case of the prairie grass and the oat, to collect a specimen down to the roots. You'll find this one's rather easy to dig out because it has quite shallow roots. The inflorescence is the part of the plant that has the spikelets attached, the seed head. The leaves have a flat blade and a smooth sheath unlike the prairie grass and at the junction between the two there is a prominent ligule. So see if you can find the large quaking grass, oat or prairie grass. As you said about looking for your prairie grass, oat and large quaking grass, I'd like you to also collect two other grasses of your choice. I want you to find the grasses that differ in as many ways as possible from those other three species. That's going to require you to pay special attention to all those things that I mentioned before. The inflorescence, the spikelets, the structure of the leaf, things like hairiness. And in doing so, I'd like you to take a piece of paper and a pen and record for me all of the different ways that you think grasses might differ from each other, and in particular things that might be useful for identification. To be clear, I'm not looking for something like a particular smell of a particular grass. What I'm after is things like the length of a spikelet. That's what a botanist would call a character of a plant. So length of spikelet would be one thing that differentiates grasses. Presence of runners would be another. So you've now got two things to start your list. And I'd like you to compile a list and bring that along with your grass specimens the next time we meet. That's the end of this video. Until we meet up again, please go out and collect those three sorts of grasses, or even if you can just find one, that will serve the purpose. Compile that list of all the characters that might differ between grass species, and I'll look forward to seeing you when we'll get stuck straight into the details of grass structure and the things you need to understand and focus on as you identify grasses. Bye.